chapter 10. We're looking at some fundamental truths that haven't changed and that will not change. Truths that we can, we can stand on. And tonight we're going to look in, here in Mark chapter 10. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to begin to read in verse number 41. Mark chapter 10 and verse 41. The Bible says, And when the ten heard it, and I'm going to pause right here and I'm going to tell you what they heard. They heard James and John jockeying for position in the kingdom on Jesus' right hand and his left hand. They were, they were trying to get a good word in there. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. Now don't let the Protestant movement uh, change the definition of biblical words here for us. Minister doesn't mean bishop or clergy or something like that. It means servant. That's what Jesus is saying right there. Um, he says, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister or your servant, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. In other words, Jesus didn't come to this earth, born in the flesh, and live an earthly life to be served by others, for the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And then here's a phrase I really wanted to get to tonight, and I'm not going to divorce it from its context or anything like that, but it is where we're going to focus in tonight, this statement, and to give his life a ransom for many. To give his life a ransom for many. So many of you, if not all of you, know about the argument between the disciples before the crucifixion, about when Jesus came to establish his kingdom, who was going to be the greatest in that kingdom. And we have several times in the Gospels where Jesus calls them aside and, and tries to teach them and straighten them out on this matter that, God, that, that Jesus did not call them to follow him to make them great, but to make them servants. He, he, he said that again and again. He would, it would be like this, boys, this life that I've called you to is not about you, it's about others. I have called you to be a servant unto others. So, we would expect if that's the case that Jesus, the God-man, came for the same purpose. He came not to be served or ministered unto, but he came in the deeds of his life to be a servant unto people and even in his death, he served people because he came to give his life a ransom for many. The truth, the, the foundational truth that we're going to look at tonight that has not changed, will not change, it's absolutely rock solid, is this. Christ's atonement is enough. Christ's atonement is enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your word. I pray that you'd teach us from it tonight. Instruct us from the pages of this book. God, I thank you for what you've done for us in the person of Jesus Christ and what has been accomplished. And God, help us to be reminded of that. Lord, I don't pretend tonight that I'm preaching anything new. But God, I do believe I'm preaching something foundational and something that we need to be reminded of and we need to hear again and again to be reminded that we're not who we were in Jesus Christ because uh, what you've accomplished on our behalf makes us different. It makes our life different. It makes eternity different. And I'm thankful for that. And uh, pray that you'd bless this time in your word tonight. In Jesus' name, uh, amen. <clears throat> Jesus came to give his life a ransom for many. I, I, I just want to kind of break down that phrase for a moment tonight and take a, uh, just take an in-depth look here at what 
it was what was said about Jesus and, he, and what he came to do. Uh, he came to give. He didn't came, come to take uh, anything from humanity other than our punishment. Uh, he, he also took a lot of grief from humanity, didn't he? Uh, he took a lot of persecution from humanity. Uh, he took a lot of ills and woes from humanity, but he came to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, I want to deal with a couple of things before we look at some other scriptures tonight. Uh, first of all, that word ransom, that's a good word. Uh, it means a price paid for redemption. Uh, it means atonement. He came to literally provide an atonement. Um, and uh, the, the, the Greek word where we get our word ransom uh, is uh, actually the word luo, which is where we get our English word loose. He came to set us free. He came to loose us, loosen us from the bonds that held us and the slavery that, w that, that we were in. And the idea of a ransom is that he paid the price that was owed. And he did that all by himself. He came to give his life a ransom. And then I'm going to just comment briefly on what the Bible says here for many. And uh, help us with this because uh, the Calvinist likes to grab hold of this verse. And he likes to say, now I want you to notice something. Jesus didn't die for everybody. Jesus didn't come to give his life for everybody because Mark chapter 10 and verse number 45 says he came to give his life a ransom for many, but he doesn't say he came to give his life a ransom for all. Now, does anybody see a problem there? Well, there is no problem there, and here's why. We've got enough alls in the Bible to take care of a, of a wrong interpretation in this passage right here. Now, I want you to understand why, why he said many as opposed to all right here. Um, by the way, um, he does say all, that, that, that he is to be the chiefest, is to be the servant of all, and that Christ came to give his life a ransom for many. Think about where the disciples' minds were in the context of this passage. They were looking at one person. They, they were ministering to one person. They were seeking to serve one person. They were living their life for one person. They were seeking the advancement of one person. And do you know who that person was? It was self. That's who they were looking for. James and John came looking for positions for themselves. The ten got upset because they wanted something for themselves. So what we have here is that Jesus didn't come and, and participate in the earthly ministry that the Father gave him to do, to do it for himself, but rather, he, instead of acting on behalf of one, he acted on behalf of many. That's why we have that there. So there's no theological hardship, and no, that verse is not saying that Jesus only died for some and not for all. And just, just in case somebody's put a, a bug in your ear or a speck on your glasses uh, to make you see things in Scripture that aren't there, let me give you this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5 uh, that says um, in verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now somebody could say, reconciled us. Isn't that the saved? Isn't that those that have believed? Or some would even say, isn't the us the chosen there? Or something like that. Well, you just got to keep reading. He says, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, or that means because, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us 
the word of reconciliation. So who did God reconcile unto himself in Jesus Christ by his death? Well, Paul said, the world, whose sins are not imputed unto them in Jesus Christ. The world's sins. That's all right there. So, so uh, that's, that's enough of that. We'll just move on. But Jesus, look, look, in some circles, this is a big deal. Because there is a false doctrine called limited atonement. And the idea of limited atonement is that Jesus' death did not cover all sin of all men. It only covers those for whom Jesus died to save. This did not come from the Bible. This idea did not come from Scripture. It came from reasoning of, of false teachers and false believers who had to come to that conclusion by their doctrine of a chosen uh, uh, salvation because otherwise you have to lay a whole lot of blame for lost people at the foot of God. And you have to have Christ's death uh, being unsatisfying, if you will. If Jesus died for all the world and all the world can't be saved, you got a problem so instead of changing their doctrine to say all can be saved, they changed their doctrine to say that Jesus only died for some. So it didn't come from Bible. It didn't come from a single verse of Scripture. It came from reasoning as a necessity of the false doctrine. In Ezekiel chapter 13, the idea given there is that one man builded a wall that was a horrible wall and would have fallen down a long time ago, but others came along and daubed it with untempered mortar so that it would stay standing. And that's exactly what Calvinism is. It's a horrible, horribly constructed wall that people keep daubing with untempered mortar, else it would have fallen down a long, long time ago. And there's a lot of other doctrines I could go into about that too, but that's not what the message is about. Quit distracting me. We've got to talk about Christ's atonement tonight. It is an unlimited atonement. It is unlimited. He died for all. <laughs> the Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and that he died for all is what it says. Now, we've got to ask ourselves, what does this idea of atonement or ransom really mean? Well, it means this, God's holy. God is just. God is righteous. And God in His righteousness and God in His holiness has no choice but in His character to have a hatred for sin. And because of that, all the way back in Genesis 3, and we covered it this morning, so I just get to refer there tonight and, and bring it back to your mind again uh, because I know you were paying very close attention this morning and didn't miss anything. But the fact is, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, it brought a barrier between God and man because God is holy and now mankind are sinners. So for man to be reconciled back to God, there is a price that had to be paid. A sin debt had to be owed. And it was owed by mankind. Watch this. Man owed the debt and man had to pay the debt. That's the only way that would work. I want to say it again because that's important. Man owed the debt and mankind had to pay the debt. You say, what is that debt? Well, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, we're told what that debt is. And I just wonder if somebody tonight would raise your hand and I'll call on you. And you could quote at least the first part of Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the cold one? For the wages of sin is death. Wages are something that you earn. You work for them. You deserve them. You ought to get them because you've earned them. That's wages. The wages of our sin is death. That's the punishment for sin. That is the debt that every man owes to a righteous God for the life that was squandered, for the life that was forsaken, 
for the life that was abandoned, uh, we owe life for the life that we lost. And so God demands a sin debt that is death. The wages of sin is death. And if that was the end of the story, it would be a horrible story. It'd be a horrible story, especially for you and I. Because if that's the end of the story, you and I are hopeless. And here's why. Because all manner of self-atonement is futile. It doesn't work. The only way man can atone for his sins is to die and be separated from God for all of eternity. And, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to atone for my own sins. And yet I have chosen sin. I have consciously chosen to sin against God, and I deserve death. I'm trying to paint a picture for us here to understand how big of a deal this really is that God, very God, became man so that as man, that debt could be paid in full so that all men could be free. So that all men could be released. And so God came in the garden uh, in, in, in Genesis chapter 3, and when he was talking to Eve, he said, I will put enmity between, uh, between thy seed and her seed, and, and, and uh, he's going to come, that seed of the woman's going to come, and that seed of the serpent is going to bruise his heel, but in the process of that, that seed of the woman is going to bruise his head. He's going to end his reign. He's going to take his dominion. So here's the thing. From the moment we were born in sin, sinners by nature, we quickly became sinners by choice, we are under the condemnation of God. Here's, what, here's how the Bible says it. The wrath of God abideth on him. It's already there. We're, we're under the sentence of death. Death is already at work in our temporal bodies. Our spirit is dead and cut off from God. And our soul is under the condemnation of eternal death or what the Bible calls the second death. So here's what we've got. We're under the, we're under the curse of death. That's what we owe. And the promised seed of the woman came. Now you have to fast forward to the book of Matthew to get there. But that promised seed, Jesus Christ, came and he was God, but he was man. Now, in order for him to be a fit sacrifice that would be acceptable to God as a substitution, he had to be sinless. He had to be innocent. He had to be guiltless. He had to be perfect. He had to be without spot and without blemish. Everybody with me? Let me say it more simply. He had to be God. Because God's the only one that can be all of those things. So he had to be God. But if you'll remember, I said that man owed the debt and by man the debt had to be paid. So if he's going to pay the debt for you and I, he has to be God to be a fit sacrifice. But he had to be man to be the sacrifice. So God became man. Um, I believe this is what the intricacies of this are what Ephesians calls the manifold wisdom of God. Only God could put all this together, cover all the bases, deal with every detail in, 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 the, in its finite minutiae. And it's our honor as God's children to spend our time in his book and with the Savior to learn everything that Jesus did for us in providing for us an atonement for our sin. I, I'm still learning it. How about you? I, I'm still discovering things all the time. Th that's why a message like this, even though these might be truths that you've heard before, is not a waste of time 
Because there could be something that comes up tonight that you go, I never thought about it from that perspective before. You mean Jesus did that for me? Yes, he did. He did. Genesis chapter 3, we talked about this, so I get to, I get to fly right over this. He made coats of skins requiring the life of animals. But let me tell you something. In Hebrews chapter 9 and 10, remind us of this. The blood of animals can never atone for sin. They were a picture. Uh, we, we don't ever, in this independent Baptist church, we don't ever kill an animal uh, to make ourselves right with God. That would be cruelty to animals. You say, well, why wasn't it cruelty to animals uh, back then? Because God made animals and God said, I want you to do this at certain time frames and at certain intervals and, and, and for those purposes. But let me tell you something, those sacrifices had a pretty major purpose because those sacrifices, though, though the life of those animals that was given never atoned for sin, they were a picture pointing the faith of those Old Testament believers ahead in time to the blood that would satisfy God for my sins and for your sins. So every time they took a goat and they shed its blood and took its life. Some of you might look at that and say, poor goat. But what you ought to look at it and say is, that's what my Savior did for me. Every time, a, every time a lamb, a little lamb that was separated from the flock and brought up to, to be separated and holy and without spot and blemish so that it could be the adequate picture that it needed to be. And then they would take that lamb and kill that. Let's not act like there wasn't emotion attached to that. For every family that brought that lamb for a sacrifice. But the emotion is not over the sadness of the loss of an animal, the real emotion ought to be, that's what Jesus had to do for me. Why, preacher, why? Why did an animal have to die? Why did fig leaves not cover? Why did God not accept Cain's sacrifice? There's an answer. There's no blood. Turn to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 with me. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse number 11. He says in Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So all of those blood sacrifices that God commanded was not given by God for the purpose of cruelty to animals, but put to be a testimony and a picture of what only His Son could ultimately accomplish. So they'd bring that sacrifice in, they'd shed its blood. They would sprinkle its blood upon objects of the tabernacle and, and later on they would do that in the temple in a place called uh, the holy place and then they would the, the high priest would go in once a year with the blood of a sacrifice and he would sprinkle that blood uh, upon the mercy seat and, and, uh, and he would make atonement in that sprinkling of blood for the people and let me just tell you all of that was a picture it was a picture was it important? yeah it was important but it didn't work. And God knew it didn't work. Because its design was not to work. Its design was to point. Its design was not to tell those uh, children of Israel, hey, look, put your faith in this goat. Put your faith in this heifer. Put your faith in, in, in this lamb. No, no. Put your faith in the promised Messiah and God's promise to make all things right and all things new once again. It was a picture looking forward to Jesus. So here Jesus comes. And John the Baptist is his forerunner and he's preaching. 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Make straight paths for your feet, because there's one coming after me who's preferred before me. And Israel got ready for its king until Israel rejected their king. And the religious leaders of the day said, he's not our king. And even though, even though it was evident by the power of the Spirit of God that was upon Christ's human ministry, they denied his miracles and they denied his person. And they said, he casteth out devils by the power of Beelzebub. This was an ultimate rejection, a blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And the power by which God, uh, Jesus Christ, did his miracles. And in Matthew chapter 10, 11, and 12, the message changes from repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand to come all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. No longer was he preparing the house of Israel for their kingdom. But he set out to prepare hearts for redemption. He lived a perfect, sinless life. I don't know if you've ever sat and meditated on that or thought on that as you've gone throughout your day, but I, I dare say you and I can hardly fathom a human being living a sinless life, a perfect life that Jesus did. You say, is it necessary that he did? It's absolutely necessary. One sin and his death is for him. His death is the wages that he had earned. Only a sinless, spotless Savior could be a substitu substitutionary death for the sin of the whole world. So he went to Calvary. He was beaten, smitten, I got news for you. He was bleeding long before they ever put nails in his hands or his feet. Long before they raised that cross and dropped it into that hole in the ground. No, he was already shedding his blood. But the Bible is very specific that he bled. As a matter of fact, even after he died, the Roman soldier came along and in fulfillment of prophecy, instead of breaking his legs like they very often did to hasten the death of prisoners being executed by crucifixion, when they found him to already be dead, that Roman soldier took that spear and he thrust it upward into his side underneath his ribcage. The Bible says out flowed or out poured blood and water. You say, what, what in the world is that all about? Well, I'm... I believe a scientific explanation would be the piercing of the pericardium around the heart, which would have produced not only a, a, a massive outflow of blood from that, from that open wound, but also the fluids surrounding the heart muscle right there inside the pericardium, and all that flowed out of him. And I'm just going to tell you, I don't know how much blood loss there was, but I do know this, he shed his blood and gave his life. Because Leviticus 17.11 says that life is in the blood. They buried him in a tomb. He rose three days later. I don't know exactly the chronology of it, but I know this. Sometime right in there, Jesus took a trip. Nobody saw him do it. But he did. He went back to heaven. And he took something with him. You see, what was set up by God in great detail that Moses wrote down and constructed on earth, that holy place and that holy of holies, all of that was a figure, an earthly figure of what already exists in heaven. There's an earthly and there's a heavenly. And Jesus didn't need to go into the earthly to accomplish it. As a matter of fact, when he was hanging on the cross, something happened at the earthly holy of holies. That veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies 
was ripped in two, it was torn in two from the top to the bottom, signifying that it wasn't just the high priest that could go in anymore, but it was open for all to come into the presence of God. That place that God had said in the Old Testament, I will commune with you from the mercy seat. I will commune with you from the holy of holies. Now all of a sudden, there's open access. And you know why there's open access? Because something happened in heaven. And Hebrews tells us what happened in heaven. It's, I'm not going to go there and read for the sake of time, but you can go read it for yourself in Hebrews 9 and 10. What happened in heaven was Jesus, now as the great high priest, took the blood of the perfect sacrifice. I don't know if you're catching this, but Jesus is all of these things. He's the great high priest. He's the perfect sacrifice. He took his blood into the holy of holies in heaven and sprinkled his blood in heaven so that God accepted his blood as a covering for all sin. And sin, in one moment, was atoned for. Before Almighty God, it was done. So you say, no, wait a minute, preacher. If that's the truth, if sin's atoned for in heaven, and God sees the blood of Jesus Christ then a person doesn't really need to get saved, do they? They don't really need to put their faith in Jesus. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Christ's atonement was sufficient to save all sinners. But the Bible also teaches that that salvation, that atonement, is only efficient for those who put their trust in Jesus for salvation. So is it sufficient? I base my eternity on that belief. I believe that Christ's atonement was sufficient for me, and I believe that when I trusted Jesus as my Savior, repenting of my sin, that Christ's atonement became efficient in my life, and I was hid with Christ. Uh, hid in Christ with God. When God sees me, he sees me through the blood of his son that covers me, and therefore God sees me now and forever as righteous. Do you realize the sufficiency of Christ's atonement is the basis for the biblical doctrine of eternal security? Once saved, always saved. Don't chuckle that I'm bringing it up. I've talked with independent Baptists recently who are struggling with that. But I'm asking you, don't struggle with that. If one one aspect of it was up to me, I'd mess it up for sure. I'd mess it up for sure. But salvation was his idea. It was his plan. He did it all. All I did was accept it. He offered it, and he offered it freely. And one day in my life, I said, Lord, I want. And he said, you have. Now, me saying, God, I'm asking for it is not a work. That's not anything I did to earn salvation. He offered it freely. Listen listen to the rest of that verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift... Why did he use words like wages and gift? Well, because wages is something you earn. But gift is something that you do not earn. There's nothing you can do to earn. Because if you earned it, it's not a gift. It ceases in its giftness at that point. But if it's a gift, it's unearned. Gifts are offered and accepted. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He offered, I accepted. And what he offered, he did by himself entirely. 
He didn't need my help. He didn't need my ideas. He didn't need my efforts. Any, anything that bore my fingerprints would have messed it up. But thank God my salvation is nothing but his fingerprints. It's nothing but his handiwork. His plan, his design, he carried it out to perfection and now he offers it to all of humanity and simply says, will you take it? Will you agree with me that you're a sinner and you need my salvation? And would you just accept it as a free gift for you so that you can be reconciled back to me? He is saying, and we can go out and we can preach this to all the lost, God has ransomed you. <laughs> can you imagine if there was such thing as a limited atonement? How would you do evangelism? I mean, think about this with me. You go up, you knock on a door. Somebody comes to the door. Hi, my name is uh, Joe Decker. And I'm here from South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church. And if you got a, just a minute, I'd like to talk to you about God's Word, and what He said. Okay? Well, uh, I just want you to know that the Bible says that we're all sinners in need of salvation. Okay, I've been thinking about that. Uh, all right, well, you've been thinking about that. That's a good thing. Uh, um, well, well, then the Bible says after that that the wages of our sin is death and separation from God. Oh, man. What do I do? Well, um, you don't have to do anything. Actually, Jesus came and he died for some people. <laughs> And, and maybe for you. Uh, okay, well, how do I know? Well, that's it. You, you can't until it's all over with. And if you go to heaven, then you were one. <laughs> and if you don't, then sorry. This has been the good news of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. It makes me sick. You won't find that gospel. That is another gospel. You won't find that gospel preached anywhere in the New Testament. No, people went out into the highways and the hedges and they had freedom to tell everybody they talked to, Jesus died for you. Jesus died for your sin. God has ransomed you from your sinfulness. Would you accept his salvation? We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. He already reconciled you in his son. Be reconciled to God. And we can go out and we can tell everybody that. We don't have to stand on somebody's front porch or sit on their couch in their living room and say, now let's try to figure out if you're one of the chosen or not. We just go out there and say, God loves you. And the proof of that is Jesus died for you. And he wants you to be saved. And he wants to, to forgive you today. And I challenge you, would you accept him as your Savior? Would you repent of your sin and become his child? Because he, he wants to do that for you. Why? Because his atonement is sufficient. His atonement is sufficient. One last thing and I'm done. Once the price is paid, atonement means you're free. I, I believe Paul said it like this. If Christ has made you free, why would you continue in those things that used to bind you and mess you up and bring destruction into your life? You're ransomed. You're set free. We've talked about some doctrinal blasphemies tonight, but can I lay something on you? How much of a blasphemy is it to have accepted God's salvation and continue in the bondage 
for which he died to save us out of. I'm telling you, the understanding of Christ's full atonement ought to do something in our life and affect the way we live. We ought to want to be free from that stuff. We ought to reckon our old man to be dead so that this new man can live in the glory of our salvation. But so many times, we're trying to perform CPR on that old corpse and try to raise it back to life again. And think about, think about how God sees that. Jesus died to set us free. He paid a penalty that we owed. Is it any wonder Paul said, I'm a debtor. <laughs> and he didn't consider that he owed God a debt because Christ had already paid that debt. But he said, look, now that Christ has paid my debt, I consider myself to be a debtor to the lost. I consider myself to be a debtor to other people to live for Christ and be a testimony of somebody who God has saved and who Jesus died for. So atonement sets us free. Free from the sin. Free from the bondage. Here's one of my favorites. Oh, I'll never get over this. Free from the guilt. Free from the guilt. If you, if you understand biblically Christ's atonement, not only do you ask him to forgive you of your sin, but you lay the guilt at his feet and you go on and follow him. You go on and walk with him like you're somebody. I'm not talking about pridefully. I'm not talking about foolishly. I'm not think, talking about thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but I'm talking about in the freedom of knowing that sin is gone and it cannot be held against me anymore. I'm free from the presence of that sin. I'm free from the guilt of that sin because Christ's atonement paid for all of that. He bore the sin. He bore the guilt. His blood covers it all. Uh, by the way, we're going to keep singing songs about the blood around here for that very reason. What can wash away my sin? Well, you know the answer. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty states. Oh, the blood, the blood covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with my sin and stain my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there. And Calvary covers it all. What a privilege to be free tonight because of a sufficient atonement through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd strengthen your children tonight. Lord, thank you.